song entitled, The Longer I Serve Him. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. Appreciate that piano playing there, too. <laughs> Open your Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of John, chapter 12 in the book of John. Let me lay just a little bit of foundation for the thoughts this morning before I begin. But we need to understand something that when we get to this 12th chapter, you see there in the very first verse it says, Then Jesus was six days before the Passover. That means that he had just six more days left on his earthly ministry before he paid the ultimate sacrifice for your sins and mine six days before Calvary six days before the grief and the heartache of the garden six days is not a very long time but sandwiched into that we find a thought brother Neil told me is the, ver the verse that's on the bulletin he said, there's no way you can make a message out of that verse, but I'm going to try. I hope I can. But you find it six days before he paid the ultimate price. But you know, what he's talking about here is, is let's read the text, and then I'll go on. Then 
Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spiked art, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me ye have not always. Then it says, Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, also whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. They also might put Lazarus to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So what we find is here, it's a place where Jesus was no stranger to. It was the house of Bethany, it's the house of Lazarus and his two sisters that were he was going to. But you know, we find that here, six days before he was to face Calvary, it says that folks came to see him. Now Jesus had healed others. Jesus had healed uh, the centurion son, or, or uh, the, uh, the, I can't think of his office right now, but in Capernaum, he had healed the daughter there. He had also, in a city of Nain, had healed a young man that was being carried in a beer and was stopped the funeral possession and restored this young man to his mother. But here we find something happen. Here we find that this particular healing, this particular miracle, was really done where it was with the very center of the Jewish nation. It was here that uh, people became really disturbed about it. Because if you go back and, and read in the previous chapter, you find the healing of Lazarus. When Jesus had deliberately tarried until Lazarus was dead and said, Now let's go. And how Mary and Martha had met him on the way and simply said to him, Lord, if you'd have been here, he would not have died. But see, the thing of it is, everyone there in that area, this is where the high priest was. This is where the center of the Roman government was in the city of Jerusalem, the city of the Jews. And so it was, became very well known. And we find something here that when this feast was announced, it wasn't a small feast. It was a feast that I would often wondered why they didn't name it. Because there is said, we're told in that passage of Scripture, that there were the chief priests, and they consulted how they put Lazarus to death. Well, they had to have some representatives in this feast. They had to be, uh, many of them, it says, that had come. And much people, the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but also for Lazarus. And Lazarus there was also had a drawing power for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's the thing that we need to understand. That we have a responsibility. We are miracles in our own right because we were dead in trespasses and sin. And the day that you met the Lord Jesus Christ, the day that I met the Lord Jesus Christ, we were made alive. Now, we weren't in the grave, but we were just about <laughs> to put our foot in the grave. But the thing that I'm trying to bring out is this, that here he begins this assembly of what I'm going to say is a perfect picture of the church 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because really that's what God's been doing. That's what the Lord has been doing all along. Calling the disciples. Calling those that are going to be his messengers. Calling those that have different talents and such. When he'll find that first church that we find on the day of Pentecost. Because really what this group that here, this that he calls a, a feast, it's really a picture of the church. Because I want you to consider something. There was, first of all, an assembly of disciples. The first time we hear in this group that met there in the house of Lazarus, they were disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, we hadn't called it formally the ecclesia, which means an assembly, but that's what this was. They called it a feast, but it was still an assembly of those that knew the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it resembles something when it says a supper. We think of the Lord's Supper. One of the great traits of our local New Testament Bible-believing church is recognizing of the Lord's Supper. So the thing of it is here, we have that. So he said here that they sat at table with him. That's what we're told to happen here. When he gathered, when Jesus was there, when Lazarus was there, it said that all these that were attended in, I don't know how big it was, I don't know how big a house that uh, Lazarus had, but it said simply that they sat at the table with him. And my friends, listen, that is the Lord's table in fellowship. Because what does the Bible say? Wherever two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. You know, I keep emphasizing this, but somehow or another, I think folks don't quite really draw or gather or accept that statement. Because Jesus said, where what, two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. Well, there he was in the midst of this assembly, but I'll tell you something else. He's also here in the midst of this assembly. Hebrews tells us, they forsake not to assemble yourselves together, the manner some is, so much the more as you see the day approaching. And the Lord plainly tells us that if wherever you are, he said, I will be there. So he was present in this feast as well. Now there were much people of the Jews, regardless of why they came and for what purpose, we uh, are not told. The priests were there. They were there in criticism as far. But verse 12 said there was much people. Now some came to see Lazarus. And some came to see Jesus, we're told. Has you ever really thought about Lazarus and Jesus in the same place? But yet we're plainly told that some came to see who? You would think they all came to see Jesus, wouldn't you? But no. Some came to see Lazarus. Why? You say, well, why not? This man was raised from the dead. You know, I believe that what happened to Lazarus and the life he had after that, I've often wondered. You never hear any testimony from Lazarus. You know, you never know anything about him, but here they said was something be raised from the dead. Now, as I said two other times, they weren't much spread about, about Jesus raising the dead. But here they came because of Lazarus. You know, that's almost like he was a testimony of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came, and they wanted to see him. You know, I wonder how many times you might think, how many folks come to the house of God because of your testimony? How many times do you have folks that you say, come and go to church with me? I mentioned that this morning. We didn't have any visitors. Why? Because nobody came as a visitor. But we think of it is, it's we have a responsibility to see if we can't draw them. So they came to the supper, and I believe that we need to understand that that's talking about the church. So we find in this assembly, we find, first of all, the participants. Jesus was there. And regardless of that, there was Mary and Martha and Lazarus. These were the ones. This is a different story here than it was the last time we read in the Bible about these three. Because we found that when he came into the house there, uh, Mary uh, with Lazarus, and there was Mary and Martha. Martha wasn't a happy woman. She said to Mary, why don't you come and help me serve? But that's not a question here. We find a perfect, harmonious situation. We find, first of all, Martha's still serving, but she's not griping about it. 
She's not uh, hesitant about it. She simply made a feast. Lazarus said, let's make a feast. She didn't say, now I'm not going to make this feast if Mary doesn't help me. But she simply started to do it. Started to prepare it. For why? Because what she did, she did for the Lord. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And you know, that's part of the testimony that we have. Whatsoever we do, it ought to be for the, the glory of God. So we find then that Mary, I think, was really the spearhead behind, or excuse me, Martha was still the spearhead behind the preparation there. I imagine Mary was partly involved in it. But somewhere in the course of this, we find that Mary did something very different. Mary took this, 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 Mary took a, a pound of the ointment spike guard, very costly. <laughs> you know, God put that in there. The Holy Spirit put that in. He could have just said Mary brought this, uh, this oil spike guard. But he said, I want you to know something about what she brought. It was very costly. Well, so costly that some folks thought, well, what, what she, she's anointing uh, his head, she's anointing his feet, she's wiping his feet with her hair. Why is she wasting all this? In fact, one of them spoke up. Judas Iscariot spoke up. He said, he knew the value of that, what she brought. He said, why wasn't this sold for 300 pence and we gave it to the poor? I tell you, sometimes I don't care what kind of assembly he had, you're going to have somebody that thinks it ought to be done another way. You're going to have somebody going to complain about something. The choir was off key. Uh, the Sunday school teacher wasn't ready. Preacher was lousy today, and I may be today because I've been struggling with this, this message, as, as Brother uh, Neil told me. He said, you can't make a message out of that, and I'm not sure I can yet. But the thing of it is, we need to understand this. How I thought, Well, she went and anointed his head. And so he, he complained about it. So what we need to understand is that Mary was there and Judas was there. So we see in the church, we see Lazarus was there and we see Jesus was there. You know, basically, that's kind of a cross-section of what we have today in the church. Which one you fit or which one fits you, I guess I should say. But, but you know, you never know why somebody comes to church, do you? Never really do know. Most of them will come because they have been in, invited. But some will just come out of curiosity. I remember why I went to church. First time I went to church, I went to church because I was dating a young lady. And that was the only place her mother would let me take her. And so I went to church, and it changed my life. So you don't have the reason. I don't know why here. Some go to church because, well, if, if you're a young lady, uh, there is maybe a handsome boy or two that shows up. Or if you're a young man, you go to see a young lady that might go. I don't know why you're here. But the thing of it is, is the fact that you are here, and you're in God's house. And allow God to speak to you. So Jesus, Martha did what she had to do for the glory of the Lord. Mary did exactly what she had to do for the glory of the Lord. And Judas, I hope we don't have any Judases here. But you know, it's, it's fact. It, I hope, well, come to think of it, I hope we do have. Because Judas wasn't saved. <laughs> Judas was lost. And he, uh, that, I hope there is some. You know, you say, well, we didn't have anybody saved. Well, maybe we hadn't didn't have anybody saved because we didn't have anybody in there that needed saved. Why did we have anybody in here that needed to be saved? Because maybe we hadn't done the job that God calls us to do. Because what did he say? He said, ye shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. So maybe we just didn't do our job of being a witness this past week. So it's so important that we understand the importance of this. So as I said, these were all here. A type of the believer meant to be a Christian. But there they are. Jesus, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and old Judas. And the Lord began to work in that heart. 
He was only six days <clears throat> away from Calvary. And yet he was willing to come together with all that would come to see him and all that would come to see Lazarus. So what I'm trying to bring out in this, how important it is that we who are in Christ, when we come together, praise God for our assemblies, but let's make it a point to talk to a friend, talk to a neighbor, talk to somebody on the street, talk to somebody that sells uh, uh, groceries, but ask someone to come into the house of the Lord. I don't really know how many might have responded to that particular service, but I believe that there was probably someone saved. Because after all, there was Jesus. And there was a living testimony of the power of Almighty God. There sat Lazarus as a living testimony of the grace of God. When Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, he meant it. And it's the truth of God's word. And we need to be spreading that message. We need to be talking to folks about the fact that there is someone that can give you relief from your sins, in fact, wash them away, and can give you the promise, the eternal promise, one time when this old life is over, can give you a home in heaven. Now, that may have been a simple message, but it is a message that we as a church need. We need to grow, and the only way we're going to grow is to visit, to meet folks on the street, to knock on doors, to do as we're planning on doing a program that we're going to be putting out where we will mail into the homes in this address a letter inviting them and a return address card inviting them to come to the house of God. And then when they need to, and when they do come, we need to greet them. You need to make them welcome. There ought not be anyone ever come through that door that one of you or two of you or three of you, I won't say all of you because the door is too small, but meet them and say, we're glad to have you. We're glad that you came. And that's what my message is all about today. You shall be witnesses of me. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Will you stand? Heads bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around. Father, I trust that you'll take my stumbling words and you'll touch hearts with it. I know we live in a busy time. I know we live in a busy world. And there's so much that we want to do, and yet, Lord, let us not get our eyes off of our, our calling to be that witnesses. God, we ask for growth, but you have said to us, go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house might be filled. So, Father, we have that responsibility of bringing them into you that you might save them. Now, Lord, if there's one person here this morning that does not know you, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to that heart right now. That when we sing an invitation hymn, that you would convict them of their need of a Savior. And they'll step forward. Take the stand in the church for which you paid for with your blood. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen.